Welcome to the Think Podcast, the show that helps you lead your family in defending the Christian message. It's the Think Pod 12 Days of Christmas, 12 current cultural challenges answered with timeless biblical truth by me and some of my friends. For more content like this, be sure to follow all our guest hosts and join the Think Squad group on Facebook, Gab, and Signal. So, Merry Christmas from the Think Institute and Happy 2022. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the one who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph got up from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Matthew 1, 18-25, Legacy Standard Bible. Well, Merry Christmas, Think Squad. It is Christmas Day, the proverbial first day of Christmas, as the song has it. And this is the holiday when we remember and celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The account of the birth of Jesus, called the Nativity, is found in the Bible. The Bible, as you may know, is a library of 66 different books organized into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Nativity story is found in the books of Matthew and Luke, two of the first four books in the New Testament that are called the Gospels. Now, for centuries, it's been believed that when you picked up the Gospels, you were reading accounts that were written close to the time of the events that they record, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus back to heaven, and the acts of the apostles, which follow the four Gospels. But what if that's not the case? Recent scholarship has raised questions about the dating of the writing of the uh, the Gospels and Acts. In fact, today it's common to run into people, whether online or in person, who believe that the Gospels were actually written hundreds of years after the events that they describe. Many believe in the power of historical study, and they believe that the best historical study unavoidably leads to this conclusion. If correct, this would cast a dark shadow on the reliability of the Gospels and the Gospel message that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and that salvation from our sins is found only through believing in Him. So we're going to focus on the Gospels in this episode because they and their central message are at the heart of the rest of the New Testament and the Bible and really of our ability to trust what the rest of the Bible and the New Testament in particular says. If the Gospels and Acts were written hundreds of years after the events they record, or they purport to record, then we'd have a hard time believing that they were actually accurate. After all, would it really make sense to think that accounts of your life, written hundreds of years from now and not based on anything that you wrote down today, would actually be accurate? Well, Maybe, but probably not. That would seem to fly in the face of common sense and the principles of good historical research. We're going to talk about those principles and whether or not they make sense given a non-Christian framework in just a few minutes. So we need to get to the bottom of this challenge. When someone raises this objection or this challenge to our Christian faith, how should we respond? And how can we prepare our families to respond to this objection, which is a common one? Well, in this short episode, the first episode of our ThinkPod 12 Days of Christmas, we're going to look at this challenge and we're going to investigate three things. First, 
we're going to talk about how you want to show that this objection, this challenge rests upon certain principles, principles about the way the world works and our ability to study the world, especially the events of the past. Now, no one ever approaches these questions neutrally. We talk about that on the ThinkPod all the time. Everyone has a perspective of the world and life that they operate from within. And you'll want to show that when someone begins from a world and life view that excludes God and believes that the Bible is false or even possibly false, that world and life view is not going to give you a foundation for the principles you need to do historical study. So we're going to talk about how, in other words, a non-biblical worldview doesn't even make sense of the objection itself. Secondly, we're going to show that the Bible itself does give the principles that we need in order to do good historical study. So to use those principles assumes that the Bible is true. And then thirdly, you're going to make a brief case for the early authorship of the Gospels and Acts. I'm going to bring in a special uh, friend, so to speak, to help with that. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to bring this conversation around to a proclamation of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, and an invitation to your discussion partner to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let's get into it. Now, when you're confronted with this challenge, you may be tempted to immediately start in with the evidence that the Bible was written early. After all, that seems to be what the objection is about. But you have to consider whether this is really the best way. See, we are defending God's truth, and we need to do it in God's way. That means that we need to have a biblical response. So what's that going to look like here? Well, we need to start by clarifying your discussion partner's question, or rather, your discussion partner's position. In order to respond accurately, you need an accurate understanding of what he or she is talking about. What do they mean? Consider asking the following questions, some of which will be very familiar with you, familiar to you if you've listened to the ThinkPod at any length. Questions like, what do you mean by that? Is that absolutely true? By what standard? How do you know that? And then, so what? So you need to accurately understand your discussion partner's position so you can respond to it accurately and out of love for your discussion partner. Understanding your discussion partner, your friend, coworker, whoever's raising the objection, is actually an act of love. It's putting the person ahead of your perceived desire to just be right and win the argument. Remember, God's word tells us to, quote, let all that you do be done in love, end quote, 1 Corinthians 16, 14. And that applies to defending your faith as well. So identify where your discussion partner is coming from, and then identify where your discussion partner may have a contradiction in his or her world and life view. Find the conflict between the destination they want to get to and the starting point where they're beginning, their basic presuppositions. In this case, the destination is the conclusion that the Bible or the Gospels or the New Testament are not trustworthy. And this starting point, this basic presupposition, is rooted in the idea that there are certain principles that allow us to judge whether or not a historical document is trustworthy. So what are those principles? The most obvious one is this. A historical account is more likely to be true if it were if it's written closer to the events that it describes as opposed to later. This is obvious. This is an obvious principle and this is the principle that your discussion partner is accusing the Bible of violating. But there are other principles at work here as well that give even the above principle, the one that we just talked about, meaning. For example, principles like it's possible to reason a true conclusion given the proper evidence. Or it's possible to study history to learn what happened in the past. Something that seems obvious to us, but that's a principle nonetheless. Or the world is consistent so that the principles of good evidence that applied in the past, say in the time of Jesus and shortly thereafter, those principles also still apply in the present and will apply in the future. If the principles of good historical research are not consistent over time, then there really is no objection here because the ones we want to apply today might not even have been the principles that were in force back in Jesus' day or Luke's day or Matthew's day. Now, we've laid out those principles. Now what we want to do is we want to push the unbeliever towards the contradiction in his worldview. Now, this might seem like the exact opposite of what we want to do, which is to show the unbeliever his need of abandoning his contradictory 
unbiblical position. However, pushing the unbeliever toward that contradiction will actually help us to do this. So it's it seems counterintuitive, but it's actually very productive. So here's where you want your unbeliever, your, your the unbelieving discussion partner to get to. Without God, how is it possible to assume that facts have any relationship to each other at all, or that our minds are aimed at producing true conclusions about the world, about the past? Without God, why would the principles of evidence, why would evidence itself even be a thing? Think about that. If you believe that we are randomly assembled collection of atoms and molecules evolved from apes, why trust any of our conclusions at all? Or if you believe that we are the product of some unguided universal force, some ethereal, you know, Brahmin uh, world force, why would we think that that force created us with minds aimed at truth? If you believe in evolution, why would you think that our minds are aimed at anything more than merely the survival and passing on of our genes? Who would trust the conclusions of apes? Who would trust the conclusions of minds that were randomly assembled or impersonally assembled by an impersonal universal force? Without God, how do we know that the universe wasn't created five minutes ago? How do we know that there even was a past? I know this sounds crazy, but these are all things that we take for granted that really don't make sense without God's authoritative revelation, without God telling us about the past, telling us for certain that there is an external world and there is a timeline of history. There's no, there's no basis without God, without biblical truth, for even 1% certainty about the past. Without God, why assume that the world is consistent? Why think that the principles of evidence that we believe today were actually true in the first, second, or third centuries? For all you know, maybe back then early authorship wasn't even important. Maybe the best way back then to learn about the past and to record the past was to just write down your own assumptions about things that happened 300 years earlier. Now, this is going to sound like nonsense to you and your unbelieving friend, but that's just the point. Without God, we are left with nonsense. Without what God says about the universe and our minds and about truth, why would we think that any of these principles apply? You take God out of the equation, the very principles that we need for historical study go out the window. So what we've shown here is that by operating within a worldview without the God of the Bible, without the truth of the Bible, a person cuts himself off from the very principles needed to make sense of historical study at all. So when someone operating from within that view of life says, the Gospels and Acts were written hundreds of years later, the correct response is, and, you know, so what? Any appeal that the person makes to the principles of historical research at this point are going to have to assume the kind of universe that does not agree with the godless worldview. So let's now look, let's turn our attention to the Bible and see if the Bible does provide a basis for those um, principles of historical research and whether, whether or not the Bible actually meets those criteria. So let's think about those conditions that are needed for this objection to stick. These principles would include you know, evidence is a meaningful concept. We can gather evidence. We can reason to a true conclusion about the past. There are rules about which, you know, sources of evidence are uh, are better than others. Eyewitness testimony is better than non-eyewitness testimony. Principles like the past can be known, and we can we can study history. We should study history. The principles that guide evidence that are true today and were true at the time of the first century or the second century, or the third century. You know, these are principles that are all required to be true in order for this objection to make sense, in order for it to stick. So does the Bible give us a basis for believing in these principles? Or is the Bible the kind of book that just says, hey, take this doctrine, take this teaching on blind faith. Evidence doesn't matter. Historical research doesn't matter. Blind faith is how you should believe. No, the Bible is not that kind of book. So let's now look at how the biblical worldview, biblical teaching, gives the basis for those principles that we need for good historical study. Let's start with the idea of eye, eyewitness testimony and evidence. Now, these are taught and supported in the Gospels themselves. In Luke chapter 1 and following, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 and following, um, 
in John chapter 11, 35, in 1 John 1, 1 and following, in these verses, the gospel writers mention how they witnessed the events that they described firsthand, or in Luke's case, they interviewed those who did so. They interviewed eyewitnesses. Furthermore, in Matthew 18, 16, Jesus himself reaffirms the principle of letting two or three witnesses, eyewitnesses, bear testimony. So what does this mean? It means that the Gospels themselves give us a basis for believing that evidence is important, eyewitness testimony is, is necessary, historical research is valid, productive, and worthwhile. The Bible certainly teaches these principles, and it, the Bible also teaches that the past can be known. So, for example, Romans 15, 14 says that the things that happened in the past that were recorded in Scripture are there for our instruction. We can learn from the past. Going back to the Old Testament, Psalm 78, 3 and 4 encourage us to teach history to our children. And Deuteronomy 32, verse 7 reminds us to remember the days of old. The study of history is important, and guess what? It's a biblical principle. If you value studying history, you should love the Bible. You can't get there with an unbiblical worldview, but if you start from the Bible, you can absolutely get to these principles of good historical research. So now we've seen two things. We've seen that an unbiblical worldview can't make sense of the very principles needed to make the objection stick. If the Bible isn't true, the Gospels aren't true, uh, then complaining that they weren't written early literally doesn't matter. Second, we've seen that the Bible does provide a basis for the principles of good historical research. They're part of the biblical worldview. We're comparing worldviews. The biblical worldview has that basis. Now, what we need to do is we need to see if within the biblical worldview, applying those principles of historical study, does the Bible live up to those principles? And you might say, well, within the biblical worldview, sure, but what about a neutral worldview? Look, there is no neutral worldview. Once you start doing historical research, whether or not you're a Christian, you are implicitly assuming biblical principles. You're implicitly rejecting the unbiblical framework, the unbiblical worldview. There is no neutrality here. Now, that, that doesn't necessarily automatically mean that the Bible is true, but what about when we take those principles that are provided by the Bible and aren't provided by the godless worldview, and what if we... Um, apply those principles to the Bible itself and see if they stand up to scrutiny. Let's talk about if the Bible meets the criteria of good historical research. Now, I mentioned that I was going to be bringing in some help for this. I am. I'm going to be bringing in a clip from J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace is a cold case detective who applied the principles that he uses to solve murder cases to prove for himself that the gospel accounts were true. And in my discussion with him on the ThinkPod back in 2020, he talked about um, the importance of dating the Old Test, or dating the Gospels and, and Acts, dating the New Testament, um, and why using the principles that you and I just talked about, we can be confident that the New Testament was actually written early. So here's a clip from that discussion. And you can knock over a lot of skeptical dominoes by just asking this question, how early and where is it written? And that was one of the first things I looked at is to say, okay, well, so as I'm reading through the, and I'm staying at this point, I'm not in the letters of Paul. I'm just staying in what I consider to be the kinds of documents, the kinds of supplemental reports I could test as a cold case detective. So that was going to be the gospels and acts, the gospels and acts. That's it. What clues do I have going back and forth? I think there's good reason working backwards from Acts to date the Gospels early, because I think if the writer of Acts is it, Luke, um, and he's got a two-volume set here, he wrote Acts after he wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he's writing them to someone named Theophilus, okay? So the point is, he's writing the book of Acts, he could have included all kinds of stuff. What you could choose to talk about, even if you talk about your wife about this interview, and I tell my wife about this interview, we're not going to recall every word, we're going to select out the things that are, for whatever purpose or reason, they're important to the conversation. Why does I mention your pocket square, I can tell you that right now, that's yeah, a nice pocket yeah, square. Yeah, exactly, so you have one too, so we have to oh. kind of... If I had known, I by the way, we did not call each other before we started this. That's too. true. We're the same outfit. So, 
but the point is, yeah, we're, we're going to, to, to be talking about things that are important to us. Why does Luke mention some things and not others? And I've listened to all the different views, but, but there's a lot of people, I don't know if you've ever studied early church history, but the people who were uh, in the sphere and who were important to Luke's story, some of them are executed and they die a martyr's death. I would think he would want to include some of those because you have got key reasons why they would be important to the story. Number one. And number two, they were the most important people. I mean, there's no, there's nowhere in the book. Well, first of all, he doesn't even mention the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And you would right. think if he's trying to make a case that Jesus is an accurate prophet, you would at least tell Theophilus, Hey, remember in the last book, how I told you he predicted this. Well, in this book, I'm going to tell you what actually happened. Right. <laughs> that would make sense to me, but no, it's not in there. That happens in 70 AD. So I was already thinking, wow, is this written pre-70 or post-70? So right now, it feels like it's written pre-70. And, and also, we know how Paul died and where he died and, and how Peter died and where he died in Rome, mid-60s. No mention of it anywhere in the book of Acts. We, we know where James died, died in 61 in Jerusalem. Barnabas died around the same a lot of the key players, if you read through the earliest histories, you'll see that they actually died, and they were, they were prominent in Luke's story. And Luke has no problem talking about death. He mentions the death of James, the brother of John. Who, who cares? Mm. But he mentions it in 44 AD. So you've got a good reason to believe this is written somewhere between 44 and the first missing death, which is about 61. So I'm, I'm, it's somewhere in that range, 44 to 60. No, well, here's the problem with that, is that then you have to figure out, okay, so he wrote the other book first, Luke. So now we know that book comes before the book of Acts, and we've got good stuff in the book of Acts, in, in Luke's gospel, actually, that I think helps us to date it uh, in the either early 50s. Uh, probably, I mean, that's probably, I, would, I, would not, I would not go any later than the early 50s if it mm -hmm. was me. Because you see that the, the, his best friend, Paul, he quotes Luke's gospel. And he calls it scripture. So if you're going to try to tell me that, that Paul is just quoting the, the things he saw from or heard from Luke, they weren't written down yet. Well, then don't, you wouldn't call it scripture, but he does that in a letter to Timothy where he quotes from Luke's gospel and from Deuteronomy, and he calls both of these things scripture. And that's, you know, then you see does the same thing in the, in the letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. He, he talks about the Lord's Supper, and he only quotes one version of the Lord's Supper. There's a lot of versions out there, by the way. There's four. Only one gets quoted by Paul. Oh, surprisingly, it's Luke, his, his buddy. But that means he has to have it as early as the early 50s. So when he writes 1 Corinthians, it has to be available to him. Now, you can argue back and forth whether or not this is Paul quoting Luke or Luke quoting Paul. But I think you've got far better reason to think it's Paul quoting Luke because all the other, again, see, it's a cumulative case. It's not that I'm just pointing to that one verse and saying that's why. I think, no, it's all of these things together that point to the early dating. Now, that to me makes it more troublesome when someone says that you can insert the virgin birth. Really? You can insert the virgin birth and nobody who knew better is going to complain about that? That's the new thing that comes in? <laughs> So right, I, because so if these so if these accounts are written during the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses, that's yeah. a lot better. That's very strong evidence that it would have been extremely difficult for somebody to come along and insert a mythical story or a story, you know, based off of you know, like we always hear, like zeitgeist and stuff, where yeah, yeah, where right. these these stories were drawn from, uh, you know, Roman pagan religions and and ancient yes. egyptian religion stuff you're not gonna there's there's no wiggle room to insert these things in the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses because they say well no that's not that's not right that's not how it happened that's right well even if it's not written by eyewitnesses even if it's somebody who's trying to pull a con or somebody who just wasn't an eyewitness they heard about it. if it's early then you're still writing it in front of people who maybe weren't eyewitnesses or weren't the writers but they would have known better if that was true or not that there was no jesus in nazareth I was there the whole time. I never heard of this guy. Right, right. You know, there's that kind of thing in the, in the record somewhere. Some, and by the way, it, again, it, it, gets, it comes down to how early it's dated. All right. So that was from my conversation with Jay Warner Wallace from uh, 2020. And if you want to hear more from Jay Warner Wallace about this, I highly recommend the resource on his website called Why I Know the Gospels Were Written Early, Downloadable Bible Insert which you can get at coldcasechristianity.com. In that article, he outlines the, these points, that the New Testament fails to describe the, the destruction of the temple, mm 
which it would have if it was written later. The New Testament fails to describe the siege of Jerusalem. Luke said nothing about the deaths of Paul and Peter, indicating that they hadn't happened yet. Luke said nothing about the death of James. Luke's gospel predates the book of Acts. Uh, Paul's Paul quoted Luke's gospel in his letter to Timothy. Paul quoted Luke's gospel in his letter to the Corinthians. And Paul quoted Mark and Matthew repeatedly. And he fleshes out those points on his website. Again, you can go to coldcasechristianity.com for that. And, uh, you know, these all indicate that the New Testament was written early, not hundreds of years later. So when you're confronted with this challenge of when the gospels and the New Testament were written, Christians, we can be assured of the following things. The unbiblical worldview can't even provide a basis for doing historical research in the first place. The minute they've begun to do it, they've, they've presupposed the truth of the biblical worldview. The Bible, including the Gospels and Acts, does provide the basis for historical research. So to use the principles of historical study is to act as though you believe the Bible is true, which if you're trying to disprove the Bible, probably not the best thing. And then finally, the Gospels and Acts do stand up to rigorous historical investigation. We just saw that in that clip. Given that the rest of the New Testament relies on the truth of the Gospels and Acts, and given that the entire Bible is aimed at the Gospel message as recorded in, gospel, in the Gospels, by demonstrating that the Gospels and Acts were written early, you can be confident that the rest of the New Testament, the whole enchilada, as the Bible scholars say, is also written early and accurately describes what took place. Now, apologetics must serve our evangelism. So how do we bring all this back around to the gospel message like this? The same Bible that provides the basis for historical study also tells us something very serious. It tells us, it tells us that the wages of sin is death and that all have sinned. But the gift of God is eternal life, and that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Same Bible. You can't have one without the other. Does that make sense? Does this seem like something that you can communicate to someone else? Does this seem like something you can teach your kids to help them prepare to share the Christian message in the new year? Or is this something that you can encourage them with when they themselves are doubting or when you yourself are doubting? Look, doubts and challenges are going to to come. But we can be grateful that the God of heaven didn't leave us to flounder around in our doubts. He has given us a historically accurate and reliable book, the Bible, to guide us. And the greatest story in the Bible, the heart of it all, is how God's own son became a man to live the perfect life, die for our sins, and conquer death by coming back to life. This is the heart of the Christian message. And it's what we celebrate this time of year. And as Christians, all year long. I'm Joel Sedecase. This is the ThinkPod. Merry Christmas. Okay, that about wraps it up for this episode. The Think Podcast is a production of the Think Institute and is produced by yours truly, Joel Sedecase. The Think Institute operates under Church Movements, a ministry of Crew under the division of Crew City. To learn about how to support the Think Institute and my family tax-free, go to thethink.institute/partner. I hope you heard something helpful today. I know I did. Remember, this is not goodbye. This has just been a short stop on the journey as we learn to lead our families in defending the Christian message. And we'll see you next time. Until then, I hope it made you think. Mm -hmm.